like, we're going to be in Matthew 13 through the entire month of June, so if you'd like to read some of those other parables, and next week we're going to read this one again with the explanation that Jesus gives. Because the disciples were pretty good. They were standing there going, yes, Lord, yes, 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 of course, whatever you say, that's beautiful, that's wonderful. As soon as the crowd went away, they looked at Jesus and said, what the heck are you talking about? Because they didn't always understand what he wanted them to understand from the parables. Now, Matthew 13 is full of parables. And usually Jesus begins by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. Now, I've said to you before, and I think it's important to remember, that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is not a place. It's more of a time. It's actually more of a reality. The rule of Christ, when Christ alone will be victorious and will rule, and when hearts will bow to him. The kingdom is in our midst, Jesus told us, because he brought it with him when he came to earth, when he was born, when he taught, when he was with us, when he showed God to us in a very real and different way. The kingdom of heaven is in our midst with Jesus in our lives. But it's going to come in its fullness later on. And he doesn't say about the kingdom in this parable per se, but he's talking about the kingdom here, the reality of his reign. Now, when he goes on to explain what the parable means, he's going to tell them about what the different seeds falling in different places mean. But this morning, what I want us to do is to concentrate on the sower. Because if he's sowing seeds of the kingdom, who is it who's doing the sowing? It is God in Jesus who is the sower. It is God the Father, the fullness of God, God the Spirit, God the Son, all together in the fullness of God is sowing these seeds. How many of you have ever planted a garden? Anybody have one going this year? John McGuckin was here this morning for the early service, and he said this is the best crop of strawberries he's ever had because the birds aren't eating them because they're feasting on cicadas. Yay, birds. Go, birds, go. But when you plant, how do you usually plant? Somebody can answer this. We're going to pretend we're at the other service this morning. How do you plant? Do you just go out and sling seed around? Do you just sling it everywhere that you go? Or you carefully lay out your rows? Are they neat and straight and all that good stuff? Do you dig holes? Do you fertilize or mulch? like in the song, inch by inch, row by row. Going to mulch it deep and low. Going to make it fertile ground. Nope. This sower is sowing seed like the people on the floats at the firemen's parades. Do you remember being a kid and the candy flying off those floats? And you'd get all excited because you didn't know where it was going to land and you'd try to follow along and grab as much as you could. Without any thought of rows or straightness or care, He's just slinging seed everywhere, and it's landing in weird places. It's landing there on the ground where it's hard and the birds are eating it up. It's landing where it's going to be washed away by the rain, like my sunflower seeds were, or that other pastor named Terry, who shall remain unknown for certain. Some of it's going to land, and the weeds are going to choke it out. Some it's going to spring up, but there's not going to be a depth of soil or water for it, and it's going to go away. But he doesn't care. He just continues to sow the seed. So what is it that Jesus is sowing in this story? He's sowing seeds of the kingdom, and what would that look like? Mercy, grace, forgiveness, a fresh start, the gospel of God's redeeming love given to us in Jesus Christ, just flinging it around by the handful, by the bucketful, just slinging that seed everywhere it can land so that it all has a chance to grow. I want us to think about that this morning as we take communion, because that's what Jesus is doing. He's giving us grace. He's coming to us again and again through the sacrament of God's love for us. He's coming to us by feeding us of his very self, his very heart, his life, his body and his blood. Strange images for the disciples to hear that night before he died. Strange images for us today, and especially for kids who hear body and blood and think, what are we doing here? But what is he saying? But he's going to come and sow himself into our hearts. He's going to live in us. He's going to live through us. He's going to be the presence with us of God through the power of the Holy Spirit with us always until the end of the age. That's a tremendous promise to us. And if you remember the night before he died, he didn't say to those disciples, who here is good soil? And have you ever heard that preached in a sermon? What kind of dirt are you? Are you rocky soil? Are you good soil? Are you this soil? Are you that soil? He doesn't say to the disciples, I'm sorry, 
but raise your hand if you're going to deny me. And Peter would have said, uh, no, I don't think it's me, but Jesus would have said, you're out. Or to Judas, who's going to betray me? Out. Who's going to run when I ask you to stay awake with me in the garden and you fall asleep and then you run? Up, oh, I'm sorry, you're out too. No, he just slings the seed of grace into their hearts. And we know with them it will eventually take root, but not that night. And yet he turns to them and he says, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. And still he does that to us today. It doesn't matter how you come to Christ. It just matters that you come and you find welcome. I've said before, and I'll say it again, the best churches I've ever visited have been AA meetings. Because people go there and they're not judged. They go there and they're made welcome. If you ever have a chance to go to an AA meeting, go. Go to an open meeting. If you're invited to someone's anniversary of sobriety, certainly go, because everyone celebrates those, those milestones and everyone rejoices together because they know what it is to hurt and to be broken and to be cast out. And then they're brought into a fellowship where everyone gets it. Everyone gets it. Nobody judges anyone else, and they're made to feel welcome. They're made to feel part of the whole. That is who God is. That is what Jesus Christ is doing for us by sowing the seed. So next week, we're going to read Jesus' answer when he talks about, well, the seed is, the soil is this, and those who listen are that. There is more to this parable than we met today in this one, but I want you to focus today on what the sower is doing because we are called to live lives modeled on the sower, which means that when we do evangelism, we're not supposed to ask, I wonder who might come to Christ. Let's start with the people who look like me, who talk like me, who act like me. Let's start with them and see if we can get more of them in. We don't measure what we're doing by our potential outcome. We're called to sow in the name of Jesus Christ, to show love to everyone, to show forgiveness to everyone and a fresh start because there are people in the world who do not know they have a savior. You know that. You know your savior. And it's up to us to share the savior if we ever hope to bring people to Christ. It's one of the reasons to have two different types of worship services because we have folks who don't come to church, who don't know what church clothes are, who wouldn't own church clothes if they knew what they were. We have people who find organ music, and I loved hearing Sylvia play this morning because I grew up on organ music. I love organ music, but there are some folks who only hear that at a baseball game. Da-da-da-da-da-da. But there are people who listen to different rhythms and different tunes. We need to reach out to them as well. We need to tell them that they have a home here at Epworth. That they have a home in the body of Christ, universal. That their sins can be forgiven that their life can be made new, and that they are already loved so deeply, so deeply. But they will only know that if we are sowing in their lives reconciliation and grace, mercy, and peace. If we're saying to them, this is your Savior, because this is my Savior. I once was lost, and now I'm found. I was blind, and now I see. So I hope you'll go into the world sowing, sowing recklessly, sowing extravagantly, because we have an extravagant God whose grace knows no bounds. And if we sow in that Savior's name, if we model ourselves on him, we will have the reward of the reaping of the harvest that he talked about. Let anyone with ears, he said, let them hear. To the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, amen. Christ, our Lord, indeed invites us to share in his love at his table. We're like those first disciples. We're the ones who've made mistakes. We're the ones who've fallen short. We're the ones who have sinned against God and sinned against each other. And yet grace abounds. And so Christ our Lord calls to his table everyone who loves him, everyone who might love him, but who has a hunger in their heart, everyone who has acknowledge their sin or those who need to acknowledge their sin and yet feel strangely called to this table because this is the presence of God given for us in Jesus Christ. Christ our Lord calls the world to his table because there is room for everyone. There is a seat for you and for me in spite of all that we've done wrong, in spite of all we failed to do right. We have a seat at the table and we are welcome. We are called by scripture first to confess our sins before God and one another 
and then to make signs of peace with each other. I'm not going to let you hug each other and shake hands this morning, but we'll figure out a way to share the peace. But first I invite you to join with me in prayer. Forgive us, Holy Lord, when we fail to understand the generosity of your grace. Forgive us for carefully weighing the potential outcome of the efforts we undertake in sharing the good news of your redeeming love in Christ Jesus before we act. Open our minds, our hearts, and our hands so that we may share freely, trusting in your ability to work in and through us to produce the fruit that you desire. This we ask in your Son's most holy name.